Um, I'm delighted to be able to introduce this um, collaborative um, presentation um, in conjunction with the Energy, Environment and Climate Action um, Division. And I'd like to thank our colleagues in the Energy, Environment and Climate Action Division for, for their help in bringing um, this presentation to us and, and helping with the, the um, getting, it, getting it together. Um, so the presentation is on uh, renewable energy hubs. Um, we have um, Paul Schutz and uh, Rory Monahan here. Paul's from Board Namona. Um, he is a senior project uh, development manager at Board Namona, responsible for green hydrogen, biomethane, and e fuels. Uh, the business strategies, and he has led the uh, um, development of the Mount Lucas Green Energy Project. Um, Rory is from the University of Galway, and um, he's a professor in environmental and en systems engineering, energy systems engineering and policy. Apologies. Um, and Rory uh, leads research um, groups um, and has um, uh, projects uh, with EU and, and Irish funding um, on the go. So we're going to hand over to Rory to give his presentation first. Great. Thanks very much. Lovely stuff. Thank you. Okay, so um, thanks everyone for coming uh, in person and online. Um, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking to you about uh, what we're doing in on hydrogen in Ireland, what we're doing specifically on hydrogen in Galway. And uh, hopefully that'll lead on a little bit to uh, Paul's presentation, um, talking um, about uh, board pneumonia's plants. I'll get there eventually. I just can't see where the, uh, where the old pointer is gone. What if I just, oh, I was on the other one. Okay, now there we go. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to give a bit of background on hydrogen before I start talking about our projects because um it's 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 mentioned quite a bit these days. You go on LinkedIn, you see, you know, I, maybe the AI tells me what I see, but I see an awful lot of stories on hydrogen now. So I'm going to uh give a bit of an overview on where certainly where I think hydrogen fits and uh, the role it could play um in Ireland specifically talk to you about what this idea of a hydrogen valley is and again what we're doing with this shamrock project okay so first the uh ripping off the plaster as those of us that work in hydrogen should really do we you know we talk about the good about hydrogen so first of all i'm going to talk about the bad right now if you go out and buy hydrogen 95 percent of the world's hydrogen is produced from fossil fuels that gives it, because of the inefficiency involved in the production of that, it gives it a worse greenhouse gas intensity than natural gas. So that's the first thing. It's currently dirty. It's currently expensive. Okay, these are these are very low potential um, hydrogen costs. Um, the the two two to five euros a kilo. Um, this compares unfavorably to natural gas prices. Maybe maybe not so bad to uh, diesel prices, but 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 we're certainly it's not currently a cheap form of energy. It's a highly it's a high energy combustible fuel. Uh, got a very wide ignition um, um, uh, ignition propensity, so it is uh, it needs to be handled with care. And the people who talk about safety, they're dead right to talk about safety. Um, efficiency. People like to talk about the inefficiency of hydrogen. If you, if you convert electricity to hydrogen via electrolysis, maximum energy efficiency you're getting from that is 70%. If you take that hydrogen and convert it back to electricity, maximum efficiency is 60%, okay? So you can do your maths there and you can work out the round trip efficiency, which is significantly lower than batteries. So why do we bother? Why do we think that hydrogen is worth looking at? Well, first of all, just to give a bit of context, there's maybe three key European strategies that that set up the case for hydrogen, in my view, anyway. The first one is the Fit for 55 uh, plan, which is to reduce the European Union's carbon emissions by 55% by the year 2030. I forget what the base year is for that. So there's so many different base years, but, but um, it could be 1990 or it could be 2005. I forget which one. Um, there's the Repower EU strategy, which was brought in uh, just around the time of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And that was to uh, essentially, uh, that's an energy security measure. It's to diversify gas suppliers. It's to, it's to, it's to you know, really speed up the implementation of renewable energy. 
And then there's the long term uh, plan of net zero by 2050. So where does hydrogen fit in with all of that? Well, sort of encapsulating all of this, the EU has its energy system integration plan. And, and if you if you sort of sift through that, you see that there's four priorities. And this is this is their priority order. Top priority is energy efficiency. Second priority is circularity. So that means using waste, waste streams as inputs. Okay. So something like biomethane is a complete no-brainer when we talk about cir circularity there. Um, renewable um, electricity, sorry, direct renewable electrification. So that's that's sort of my way of saying getting more electricity used and ensuring that electricity comes from renewables. And then for the bits that are really, really hard to clean up with efficiency, with circularity and with electrification, we have clean fuels. And included in this clean fuels priority is hydrogen. There's some biofuels in there. There's carbon capture is in there as well. So this is these are the expensive options. These are the options where really no other thing suits. So I just I just want to sort of state the position for where hydrogen is uh, is 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 viewed. So what are the hard to abate sector? Well, things that are very heavy. Trucks, things that drive long distances, again, trucks, um, uh, materials that are that, that require very high process temperatures things that are very difficult to make, things that require chemicals to, to make. So uh, polymers, um, things like steel, things like cement. These are things that there is no direct way to electrify these. Now, there are some electric arc furnaces coming in, but it's unclear um, uh, how the um, electricity will actually get into these uh, steel mills. But the, this is this, these are the kinds of sectors we talk about. Then there's some other sectors that are that are that are very difficult to imagine large scale sustainable decarbonization any other way shipping especially international shipping and air travel and then there's a few other challenges that open up this is a relatively recent month this is a sort of a i, I think there's maybe a springtime month it's 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 a a kind of windy month that's uh our consistent electricity demand that's our variable wind generation and I, 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 show this, um, I show this slide to my students that if we want to fully decarbonize our electricity system and what we have available to us in Ireland pred predominantly is, 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 wind, is, is wind energy, what can we do? Um, how do we bridge that gap? Right now, that gap is bridged with combination of interconnection and um, fossil fuels. So, so how might we how might we think about the amount of energy that we have to fill to make up this gap? Well, people talk about energy storage. I'm going to be talking about energy storage quite a bit in this. An engineer will tell you the power multiplied by time equals energy. That's the total energy stored in the Turlock Hill pumped hydro station. I'm just showing it uh, to scale based on this shortfall we have between, and I'm not saying that, you know, we're, we don't have all the renewable electricity now to meet our full electricity demand. We have about somewhere between 35 and 40 percent of our electricity over the year is met by renewables. But let's just talk about storage volumes here. That's the energy stored in Turlock Hill. This is the energy stored in Ireland's biggest battery plant, which is here in County Offaly. Um, that's a, a 200 megawatt hour uh, plant. And so you see that if we're looking to bridge that gap with energy storage from, say, from windy months of the year, this is not a particularly windy month, but if we're looking to do that, we would need an awful lot of Turlock Hills. We need an awful lot of battery storage to do that. Something else we could do is we could increase our wind capacity. So let's just do a thought experiment and let's double our wind capacity. That's the dotted line is the same wind capacity just simply doubled, assuming we're a fairly small country. So it's, if it's windy in one place, it's windy in another. And what we see is, yeah, the spikes get higher, but the lows are still low and we're still left with a big, big gap. So this is what I mean by new challenges opening up. We're moving towards an electricity system that is going to be based primarily on variable renewables. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing because it's what we have. So this idea of hydrogen is a missing link. And I'll talk in a second about what green hydrogen is. This is a, 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 a schematic that kind of outlines what green hydrogen is all about. It's the use of renewable electricity to power a process called electrolysis 
that splits the hydrogen out, splits the hydrogen and oxygen out of water. We store our hydrogen, we can move it around, and we can essentially use that as a um, as a decarbonization vector for other uh, end uses. The nice thing about hydrogen has uh, is is that we can store it at scale. We'll have a look at some at some at some comparisons between Turlock Hill hydrogen storage and um, and battery storage um, uh, sizes. And we can potentially use hydrogen as a vector for 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 very very long distance transportation of energy, and I mean intercontinental transportation of energy. I'm going to talk about the end uses later on when I get specific about Ireland, so I'll not I'll not I'll not dive into them right now. So so a couple of years ago, um, the energy investor Michael Liebreich started to um, um, popularize this idea of a ladder of where different energy technologies need to be used where they're unavoidable and whether they're on and where, where they're uncompetitive and he proposed well it wasn't him who proposed this it was it was an analyst but he popularized it and people have unfortunately for the analyst started calling it the Liebreich ladder and I'm doing that as well <laughs> but um so it's 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 essentially it's like a rating for your appliances for end uses and this is this is he popularized one for hydrogen and this is our this is my research group's take on a hydrogen one for Ireland. And near the top of it, you see things that literally only hydrogen can do. If you need to hydrogenate uh, crude oil in a refinery, you know the clue is in the name. You need hydrogen to do that. Um, uh, electronics manufacturing requires small amounts of hydrogen. Power plant cooling requires hydrogen. And um, then you look at the bottom end. You see things that hydrogen could be used for passenger cars, short bus, uh, short bus routes, but it's uncompetitive compared to other options out there, electric vehicles, electric short distance buses, and then there's everything else in between. So, so, so what we try to do in our work on hydrogen valleys and our research work in University of Galway is we try and focus on those sectors where hydrogen is is either essential or is more competitive than the other technologies that are uh, that are out there so with that in mind and i'm not going to go into the you know huge amount of background and where the data in this slide comes from but what we've tried to do in our group is try to imagine some futures for hydrogen in ireland and um, this sort of helps us set the scene and helps us understand what decisions we need to make now in order to arrive at these uh, positions in the future so what we did was you We've looked at three uh, trajectories um, for hydrogen uptake in Ireland, and we've called them missing, meeting, and exceeding. Now, these are this missing, meeting, and exceeding. This refers to whether we're missing, meeting, or exceeding our overall decarbonization targets, not targets for hydrogen implementation, because we currently have no targets for hydrogen deployment in Ireland. But are we missing, meeting, or exceeding our decarbonization targets? And Maybe based on our uh, track record to date, you might want to focus on the missing ones, right? Because that's what our we've been we've been moving in the right direction, but just maybe a little bit too slow. Um, so you can see the breakdown that we are sort of envisioning, and this is based on um, we've got a team of about ten uh, funded researchers in University of Galway uh, working on hydrogen. Each of them has got a different focus for their work. Some look at shipping fuels, some look at uh, transportation fleets, some look at power generation. And what we do is we work with industry, we try to understand what are realistic, um, uh, um, maybe not targets is the right word, but realistic uptakes for hydrogen in different, in, in different timeframes. And you can see there how that relates to our current natural gas consumption. What you also see is this large bar here for exports. This is, this is, this is highly speculative. Um, this is basically having a look at what Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium are planning to import. Between the three of them, they're planning on importing an, an enormous amount of hydrogen. And what we've done is we've assumed that maybe in these exceeding targets, Ireland is meeting 5% of those, of those import targets. Right. So these are countries that are within gas pipeline distance of Ireland that are going to be importing a huge amount of hydrogen. Okay bit of detail there. What we've also done as well, and again, I'm not going to get into an enormous amount of detail in this presentation, I'm, I'm happy to talk with people afterwards, is we've looked at, to enable that hydrogen demand, 
what supply, what additional supply of renewable electricity do we need? Okay. And for comparison, I've put it in to the all island wind capacity right now between north and south, somewhere between six and seven gigawatts of wind. And this is looking at in the in the 2050 meeting scenario, we're looking at an, a, about 20, 20 gigawatts of, of wind. Okay. The darker color is onshore, the lighter color is offshore and uh, maybe five gigawatts of solar. And this is specifically dedicated for hydrogen. And again, it's just to get people's thought process and uh, thinking of, of well, if, if we meet a demand, what does the supply need to be? We've got some cost figures in there too, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna focus on the costs for now. And this is going to be in a white paper that this is a, there's a white paper that we have written and we're currently putting the final touches on it. We're going to release it um, and, um, and anyone who's interested can see the assumptions we've made. We have also then looked at what kind of storage would be needed to achieve that. Now, this is all storage in terms of terawatt hours. Where would we store this? Well, when we're storing, when we're talking about storing hydrogen at very, very large uh, volumes, um, we talk about this ge these geological formations called salt caverns. Uh, we do have a, a handful of salt caverns up in County Antrim in Larn, uh, near Larn, and those salt caverns, if they were fully developed for hydrogen storage, could store maybe something in the region of between 30 and 40 terawatt hours. So this storage capacity, if it was fully developed for hydrogen storage alone, would be capable of 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 meeting the storage requirement needs, and I've just converted Perlock Hill and the um and the battery storage plants into terawatt hours as well. Just to you know, hydrogen rightly gets slated for low efficiency compared to some of these um, energy storage means, but I just want to talk about capacity to give it to give it its dues. Okay, so that's the that's the future and the a, a potential future, a twenty forty, a twenty fifty future. What about the now? Well, the now is um, what the European Union is proposing for hydrogen are these things called hydrogen valleys. And it took me an awful long time to uh, get to grips with what this means. I still don't fully understand why we have to use the word valleys, but <laughs> someone told me it's something to do with Silicon Valley. I'm, I'm not quite sure. But, um, but what a hydrogen valley is, is an intermediate step between demo scale implementation of hydrogen and full economy wide implementation, which is what um, I've just presented in Ireland. And why is hydrogen, why am I talking about hydrogen valleys? Well, we've just started the first hydrogen valley project in Ireland. It's a project called Shamrock, which I'll talk to you a little bit about. And Paul's going to talk, talk a bit about too. Um, this is an idea that sort of grew out of some discussions that we had in Galway with local renewable energy producers, local uh, potential off-takers of hydrogen, and it sort of grew legs. And we now have 28 partners from 12 countries. We've just drawn down nearly 8 million euro from the European Union. And um, uh, we are we have been given, starting on the 1st of January this year, we have three years to build and two years to operate a hydrogen valley. And I'll talk to you in just a sec now about what that means. So first of all, who are the partners? Well, the coordinating partner is the University of Galway. So um, I have to attempt to keep this on track <laughs> um, and uh, attempt to hire people to help me keep that on track. And then we have our deployment partners. I'll talk about what they do. Uh, Board Mona, BOC, Colas, CIE, two smaller companies here, High Energy and Hive. These are involved in procuring hydrogen vehicles. We've got a hydrogen cylinders company. We've got a small airline that operates flights to the Iron Islands and the Port of Galway. And then we've got a large number of partners. I won't get into what all, all of what they do. These essentially help us disseminate and replicate our findings in other European jurisdictions. And this is why you saw all those flags on the other page. These, um, basically the European Union is not interested in funding a single hydrogen fueling station. They want to fund ideas that spread to other places. And these dissemination and replication partners are how that happens. So that's why we need so many people involved in this project. What do we aim to do? Well, we are aiming to uh, establish a hydrogen supply chain in Ireland. I'm not going to go through all, all of these, but some of the key objectives that we have here production of at least 500 tonnes of, uh, of hydrogen a year by 2028, um, seeding the first 
uh, the first hydrogen uh, suppliers and um, off takers in Ireland, um, which which would be sorry, in, certainly in the Republic of Ireland, and um, uh, trying to trying to link in some of the other hydrogen valley projects that are happening. We have this issue that we talk about in hydrogen called chicken and egg, where it's very difficult for someone to become a producer of hydrogen when there's very few off takers of it. There's no there, there's there's no customer base, and it's very difficult for someone to become a, a user because there are no suppliers. So someone needs to step in first, and that's the idea of a hydrogen valley. So our our concept is production of hydrogen uh, with our friends in Board Mona here in Offaly, um, transport of that hydrogen to Galway, um, where we will uh, our other partners BOC will um, aim to operate a uh, hydrogen fueling station on land owned by the Port of Galway. We'll see more why about the Port of Galway is involved. These will be some of our off takers. Hive uh, will be getting uh, fleet operators to test out hydrogen vehicles. Colas is a um, construction materials company aiming to, to employ some hydrogen vehicles. And CIE's bus fleets will be aiming to test some hydrogen vehicles in Galway. In the second phase of the project, we're aiming to link in with other projects that will hopefully come online during the life of this project. Have further use of hydrogen, not just in the fleets for Colas, but in the industrial processes that they operate and also doing some hydrogen fueled aircraft trials to the Iron Islands. Looking a little bit closer then, and I'll let, I'll let Paul talk about what's happening at Mount Lucas, but looking a little bit closer about what's going on in Galway, uh, this is an aerial view. So here's our, here's our site this year marked for a refueling station. Why have we chosen Galway port? Well, we have a lot of captive fleets nearby. We have CIE's Galway depot here. This is all the city buses for Galway and the coach services for the West of Ireland. Um, here's Colas's area here where they where they uh, where they base a lot of their trucks. The Galway City Link coaches, the direct coaches to Dublin, Limerick, Cork are there. Um, other urban buses here, and um, the uh, docks the, where the ferries leave for the Iron Islands here as well. So there's plenty of potential <coughs> hydrogen off takers in in the area. And as I talked about, there's a phase two as well, but I won't I won't get into the the details of that. So as part of the project, we have a number of studies that we're doing on the social, the environmental, the economic, and the replication side of things. And this is where our pan-European partners and partners from outside of the European Union are, are playing a role as well. So these will be, these are predominantly academic studies, but they're being used to spread the knowledge of what's going on in um, here in Ireland with this project. So the overall impact uh, we're contributing to the European Union's plan for clean hydrogen. We're aiming to displace 1,500 tonnes a year just from the immediate um, impact of the vehicles that we'll be running off hydrogen and the industrial process that will be um, uh, con converting to hydrogen. We're aiming for socioeconomic Im um, impacts across the business cases, investments and job creations. And we're aiming to try and uh, have an impact on hydrogen regulations because they're, it's quite difficult. If you're interested in, in setting up a hydrogen project in Ireland, it's quite difficult. It's very difficult to know who to talk to about, about, about regulations. So with that, I know I've gone on probably more than my, uh, more than my share of time here, but um, just to summarize, uh, there is a potential role for hydrogen in these difficult to decarbonize, these hard to abate sectors that we have. You know, it might not appear at a first glance in Ireland. Uh, we don't have many steel mills in Ireland, but we do have some hard to abate sectors and we do have an opportunity to export energy here. Um, the hydrogen valleys are a way that we can that we can speed this development along. And we're aiming to establish the first hydrogen valley in Ireland um, uh, with our with our partners in the Shamrock project. So with that, I'll um, I'll leave it. I don't know if we're taking questions now or if we're going to take them later, but um, I'm happy to speak with anyone at any point. <laughs> and, um, so, okay. Um, thanks very much, first of all. Um, yeah, uh, as Alan said, my, my name is Paul Schutz. I'm Senior Project Development Manager for Board Owner. So uh, thanks for the invitation, first of all. Um, delighted to be here and to talk you through uh, Born and Mona's Energy Park concept and also link it back to Rory's presentation and our own internal hydrogen roadmap. 
Um, as most of you, you know, given that we are uh, where we are at the moment for this presentation, I think a lot of you know Boardnam Owner, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the company, but uh, maybe just for people that don't know uh, Boardnam Owner. So Boardnam Owner was, was uh, founded in the 1930s as the Turf Development Board. As it says on the tin, you know, uh, our core business was to do with peat and, and, and turf, so harvesting that peat on our peatlands. Um, manufacturing briquettes for home heating, but also milling that peat and using it for electricity generation for, for decades, pretty much. Uh, we got to a point where we started a strategy called Brown to Green, transition from brown to green. And we have, um, yeah, at the beginning of, uh, and the end of last year, it was the last bale of peat that was going to Eden Dairy that was co-fired for a number of years. Uh, Eden Dairy is now one in 100% of biomass. Um, so we have successfully completed that transition from uh, brown to green. We're fully focused on renewables. Um, that actually started in 1992 with Bella Curric, the first wind farm in uh, County Mayo up in the Northwest. That six megawatt uh, uh, wind farm is actually still operating um, after 32 years. So that's uh, credit to our engineers and the team. But yeah, uh, developing large scale projects, uh, primarily in the Midlands. Um, our big advantage as board and owner is that we own 80,000 hectares of land um, that used to be peatlands. So it's a it's a vast land bank. Um, and that is just a massive opportunity for us as a business, because not only can we rehabilitate those peatlands, basically turning them back into their original state. And by doing that, capturing actually carbon, so they would act as a carbon sink, but also develop them um, as renewable energy projects. So what you can see in the background here is Owenini. Um, up in the northwest, so it's it's a very large scale uh, wind farm. It's about 100 megawatts, um, and yeah, uh, it's 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 basically just a a great opportunity for us. We, as you can see in the in in uh, on the map there, and in, um, in the center of the slide, uh, that's where all our projects pretty much are. So so a lot of them are in the Midlands. That's where we own most of the land, but then the pocket in the northwest there as well. So at the moment we have more than 15 onshore wind projects under development and it's it's kind of our core business I'll, I'll come back to that we have all also ventured into the offshore space uh, so we're partnering with ocean winds developing two projects in the offshore space um as probably most of you know offshore policy have has changed quite significantly over the last year and a half so uh you know our projects had to do the same so we're, we're still developing those projects but it, it again um, highlighted for us the immediate need to focus on onshore in the short term, but also developing the offshore project. Um, when it comes to our own uh, assets under management today, we operate about a gigawatt of assets. So that's the Eden Dairy Biomass project that I that I mentioned there. So that that used to be a peat operated uh, uh, plant, power plant that was then co fired between peat and biomass for years, and now it's fully operated on biomass only. Uh, we have a pika plant on the same site, uh, 120 megawatts. We have about 600 megawatts of onshore wind, about 100 megawatts of solar, 25 megawatts of, of uh, battery storage. So overall, pretty much a gigawatt. On the right-hand side of the slide, you basically see the assets under active development. Um, so that's anything that you can think of in the renewable energy space. So that's onshore wind, that's offshore wind, that's thermal generation. Um, that is all around renewable gas, uh, using renewable gas uh, ultimately energy storage, solar, green hydrogen, flexible technologies, um, synchronous condensers, um, the whole package basically. So that uh, those assets actually sum up to about five gigawatt in total. So that kind of goes to, shows our ambition, I guess, in, in that space as well. Um, we have five energy parks under development. And this is one I want to kind of want to focus on as part of this presentation. Again, four of them are in the Midlands and then one is in the Northwest. So. When we're talking about energy parks, what are we actually talking about? Uh, so the the first thing to highlight again is is what I what I was referring to, um, at the start of the presentation that, uh, from just given the land bank that we have and and um the asset it is for for the business, we are going to focus on the development, delivery, and operation of onshore wind assets on our land bank. Um, it is a key driver for our own revenue in the business and uh, the key value creator for, for the business as well. The other thing is that given that there was such a policy shift uh, in offshore wind, we believe that onshore wind is the 
most important, single most important technology in helping our um, meeting our, our climate targets and carbon emission reduction targets for 2030. So it's, it's a real focus for the business, which is important. On the right hand side there, you can see again our um, that the pipeline, so 600 megawatts um, on active management today and about two gigawatts of onshore wind uh, development in the pipeline. What is important to emphasize there, and I should have probably said that in the previous slide, is that those five gigawatts or two gigawatts onshore, that's not just hypothetical projects, these are active projects. So we have dedicated people working on those projects there, as we call them, real projects. So very real, um, yeah, uh, key projects that we are working on. But let's have a talk about the energy pack concept. So what is an energy pack? Uh, to put it into very simple terms, an energy pack is a co-location of industrial demand and electricity generation. So given that we have a very, very large land bank, we are basically planning to co-locate your uh, electricity generation source. So that's your wind energy, that's solar, um, with your demand, um, industrial demand um, in the same location. So that could be your distribution center, that could be a data center, that could be uh, a pharma plant, manufacturing plant, uh, whatever it is. So let's go through each individual item that we could incorporate in, into energy parks. It's, I think it's important to say that each energy park is gonna be different. So we have to really tailor um, you know, the, the, the needs of each um, energy park individually. But ultimately what we are looking at again is, is, is the wind energy on site, it's solar, um, having a grid connection to export electricity, but also import electricity when in times of low wind. Um, there's battery energy storage systems as part of, of, of the energy parks. Uh, on the demand side, you have distribution centers, you have data centers with flexible technology as, as a backup. Um, you have green hydrogen production, as Rory mentioned. So you're basically using your renewable electricity to split water, create this green gas to store electricity as well. It's green hydrogen production. Um, you put it up in, in one of the energy parks, we're also looking at an ID plant. So basically producing biomethane, injecting it into the gas grid or using that directly um, at the Pika plants um, um, on site. So just to put a bit of, Kind of a size of those uh, onto those energy parks. So we're talking about 300 megawatts plus uh, of renewable electricity generation on each individual energy park. Again, that can vary from location to location and, and the, the demands that are required as well. Um, on the demand side, then we're talking about 200 megawatts plus on, on, each, uh, on each energy park. Um, what that means that the co-location, the, the, the positive thing, I guess, about it is that uh, as everybody knows, the grid is already quite constrained and we have capacity issues with the grid in, in Ireland. So by co-locating uh, uh, demand and, and generation, you're actually shortening the, 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 the transport. So you have lower losses um, and, and the requirement also to transport electricity on the grid is, is also minimized. So it's, I think it, it, it has actually, it just makes sense <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, but let's, so that's kind of, that was kind of the broad concept. Uh, let's have a look a little bit about the specifics of it. On the left-hand side here, you, you kind of see a very similar graphic a schematic there. Um, so it's, it's all kind of an, uh, uh, yeah, a centralized solution. What is, I guess, uh, important on, on that graphic is that you can also by by co-locating data centers and pharma manufacturing plants and and other demand centers, you can use other products, intermediate products that are there. For example, using the waste heat from a data center for the pharma plant, or using the waste heat from a data center to make your electrolyzer process a little bit more efficient. So there's there's kind of really good ideas. Um, additional benefits by co-locating all those uh, very different industrial uh, things. On the right hand side, what you see there is uh, one of the energy parks, uh, which is Diagrina. And I want to show here basically is, is uh, the, the benefit of uh, those energy parks as well, given the location where they are in the Midlands. So the Midlands are, let's say, less constrained than the Dublin region, first of all. So from a grid point of view, um, you know, they, they are in this kind of 50 kilom kilometer uh, belt around Dublin, so ideally located. But also if you if you if you look at the map, I don't know if you can actually see it really well because the colors don't come out too much to to, to good. But uh so the, the the red line is obviously the boundary of our land bank. So it's quite a quite a vast uh land bank there. But what I also highlighted on that map is is all the infrastructure that is around the site. So um if I just used my laser pointer here, I can 
show you up here, for example, that would be the gas grid and the fiber is, is, is fairly close uh, to the site. So obviously fiber is required for data centers as well. You have the 400 kV um, electricity grid running down south of the site. You have the 110 kV network wrapping around the site. You have the True 20 network uh, going up here. You also have the motorway, which is really important for logistic companies um, or distribution companies. You know, for example, if they are considering using hydrogen uh, for their for their trailer fleet, um, it's in very close proximity as well. Now, what I want to show you next, and I hope this works, is is you know, to give you a, a really good sense of what this would actually look like in a, in a short little video. I, I like to visualize these things. Um, it, it basically just, the video will show you that uh, by co-locating, we don't mean stacking one thing on top of the other. Because the land bank is so vast, um, there's still a lot of space uh, in between those various different developments. We'll see if that works now. Yeah. So what we see here is basically uh, the Eden Dairy Energy Park at the center of the Eden Dairy Energy Park is the biomass station. So I guess uh, what that video clip was supposed to show you was, um, you know, the co-location of all those various different developments. So you have your solar, you have operating assets there, like like Plum Queen that was energized um, the year before last. Uh, then you have Mount Lucas Wind Farm up there, 84 megawatts. Uh, one in the background, you have Eden Dairy operating already. And then we are just uh, planning to basically co-locate and add other elements. So that's your solar, um, your battery energy storage system, there, your data center, whatever it is, you know, and, and basically bring them all into this one land bank. Um, I now want to focus a little bit more on the Eden Dairy Energy Park that we just saw there. Um, and the main reason for that is that uh, the Eden Dairy power plant, as I mentioned there, is 100% a, is a operated on biomass. So the carbon that that plant emits is considered biogenic carbon. Biogenic carbon is uh, one key ingredient for the production of sustainable aviation fuels if, if you combine it with green hydrogen. So this is, it's it's the single uh, largest single point source of, of biogenic carbon in the country. So it kind of presents us with a unique op uh, opportunity to produce sustainable aviation fuels as part of the energy concept. So that's why I kind of want to link it back to where we're here and, 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 and go into a little bit more detail on sustainable aviation fuels, hydrogen, and the energy parks as a whole. So why is everybody talking about uh, the aviation sector? Um, I attended a, a conference recently and that number kind of stuck to me. Um, there was a, a report commissioned recently and it basically just outlines that in, in order to meet our 2050 net zero targets, we need 325 million tons of sustainable aviation fuels worldwide. Now, 325 million tons, as we can imagine, is a lot. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a gigantic number. Um, what is interesting is that the European Union set mandates for SAF, um, both for, for SAF sustainable aviation fuels in general, which could also be old cooking, used cooking oils, for example, that can be blended into the kerosene mix, but also specifically for ESAF. ESAF is uh, SAF produced with biogenic carbon and green hydrogen. And the, the reason why I'm showing the graph on the left-hand side here is that those mandates actually kick in in 2030. So that's only six years away. Um, as everybody knows, it takes a lot of time to develop these projects, so we, we have to really start now. What do these percentages mean in an Irish context? Um, so if, if you look at the projected Irish demand, 
uh, 1.2 percent, which is the target for ESAF in 2030, equates to 13,000 tons of ESAF, so it's quite a substantial number. That'll increase five years later to 56,000 tons, and then uh, in 2040 to 112,000 tons. So quite a lot. Um, so if you look at the graph, you could, you could, and if you were to squeeze it, 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 it kind of looks like an exponential curve there. So we really need uh, to to start developing those projects. Um, on the right hand side, there's the projected worldwide demand for SAF. And the reason why I'm showing this here is uh, we sometimes think in Europe that, uh, you know, we are just, you know, a, a tiny area of the world and and we don't actually contribute that much. If, if you're looking at the non-Europe EU Europe figure and combine that with the EU figure, uh, we actually, uh, yeah, we are responsible for about 50 million tons of the projected worldwide demand in 2050, which is a sixth of the overall demand, which is very, very significant. So what we are basically saying is that if we have the opportunity in the endeavor to produce SAF, why shouldn't we be develop the, the, the infrastructure there, supply our own demand first, and then ramp it up as an export opportunity as well? Because other countries like Germany won't be able to meet their own demands when it comes to SAF production. There is other practical challenges for airlines. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that too much, but uh, projected passenger numbers are only going one way, and that's upwards. Uh, there's limited availability of SAF, like the old cooking um, oils. Battery capacities are not really sufficient for long-haul flights. Um, there is not a lot of green hydrogen being available at the moment. So even if the, these green hydrogen planes are made available, there's a lack of fuel. Um, one key driver here is actually the long life lifespan of planes. So when you're talking to bus manufacturers, that they have a lifespan of 10 years. So it's a lot easier to plan for those operators than it is for aircraft leasing companies that are committing 35, 40 years to, uh, to, to a plane. Um, as costs associated with the replacement of fleet, I think that speaks for itself, like buying a variant is, is, is quite uh, expensive. And then the lack of availability of biogenic carbon in general um, is kind of a, is, is, is a concern as well. When you do talk to those airlines about their decarbonization strategy, they talk about a four-tier decarbonization strategy on four pillars. I would actually consider it a five-tier decarbonization strategy. Um, but what they're talking about is efficiencies and operation. So can we, you know, make the flight path a little bit more direct? There's efficiencies to be made uh, in, in takeoff land landing. There's new technologies like the winglets that everybody knows on the side of the wings now. There's ideas of uh, putting in electric motors to drive the plane on the ground rather than using turbines uh, and save fuel and therefore save carbon. Renewing the fleet is, is one of the main drivers. Uh, well, uh, makes makes a big difference, I guess, but just having the latest technology that is a lot more efficient. But the biggest driver um, is decarbonizing the fuel. So if they want to decarbonize, it has we have to decarbonize the fuel, which is basically SAF. All those four points won't be enough. So they will still need to buy carbon credits uh, to offset their, their own carbon emissions. So what does that mean for Eden Dairy? Eden Dairy, as I said, is now 100% sustainable biomass. So it's the largest biogenic uh, single point source of, of biogenic carbon in Ireland. Um, the plant emits about 500,000 to up to a million tons of biogenic carbon a year, uh, depending on the running profile of the, of the plant. As I mentioned previously, the biogenic carbon is one of the key feedstocks for, for ESAF production. Um, we have, what we have done so far is basically we have done a high level of assessment study of the site of the plant itself to see what is the site actually able to deliver when it comes to, to SAF production. And the results have been fairly positive. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. The other key advantage of the Eden Dairy site is actually its location um, and proximity to Dublin Airport. A lot of people, when they talk about SAF, talk about production in the ports. Um, you know, and I always think, well, to be honest, that means that you have to transport your biogenic carbon to the to, to the port, first of all, which is expensive, and then transporting the fuel that you produce in the ports back to the airport. So all those transfer costs add up. So in my eyes, um, we should actually be looking at SAF production at your biogenic carbon source, ideally uh, uh, co-located with the production of, of green hydrogen as well, and only transport it there. Uh, to the airport stand. So being located 60 kilometers away from Dublin airport is actually uh, quite, yeah, quite advantageous for us. Um, as I said, so you basically, the, 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 the way it, it, it works is that you have your uh, carbon capture plant, um, 
wrapped around the the biomass plant now that sounds like a simple concept um i think uh people can appreciate that it's not that easy a carbon capture plant of that scale pretty much looks like a power plant in itself um very much the same scale uh so that that on it by itself is, is a huge undertaking um you have a lot of onshore wind wrapped around the eden dairy renewable energy complex as you saw in the video there that we can use to one the green hydrogen process uh, produce green hydrogen we can use the waste heat that eden dairy emits uh, to make our uh, green hydrogen production process a little bit more efficient so then you end up with those two key ingredients green hydrogen and biogenic carbon to produce uh SAF. now that is at the moment is kind of a magic box and the reason for it being a magic box is that there's several different technology pathways um we are currently assessing which one is the one to back up um those developments of that scale take 10, 15 years to develop. So we have to make sure now that the technology pathway that we are back in will be the right one in 15 years time. And that may be a little bit of a challenge at the moment. Um, if we were to capture all the, the carbon that is emitted by the Eden Dairy Biomass plant, the plant would actually be capable of producing 140,000 tons of sustainable aviation fuel per annum. Just to give you a sense where that lands, um, down here, you see um, a list, a graph of other SAF projects, um, and the average ESAF of output of all those projects is about 50,000 tons. So this plant would be about three times the size, uh, ranking like with the, with the probably high two biggest project up there at the moment. So it's, it is a significant development, um, but it's good because there's obviously economies of scale to be made. So the larger development, the cheaper the stuff is actually that, that we are, are going to produce there. Uh, when we look at the site, um, just to give you a sense of, um, of uh, the, 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 the land that we have available. So what, what you see here is, is the biomass power station. Uh, you see our Pika plant here, um, actually same megawatt output um, as the biomass station. Uh, hard to believe when you look at the footprint required on, on those two. Uh, you have a lot of space here for a potential future carbon capture facility. Again, that will be very much same size as the power, biomass power station itself. So it's, it's very significant. And then you have all that space available here for a future ESAF refinery. Um, you have your, you know, you, you would have to co-locate it with, with uh, green hydrogen production as well. So for the electrolyzer, we're talking about 500 megawatts of electrolyzer capacity that's but that's very significant as well um that itself needs needs quite a good bit of land as well um but yeah the the high level assessment study that we have commissioned here has been very positive but has confirmed that we have enough space and the next step for us is basically to do kind of a, a scoping study um to make sure uh that we are back in the right technology pathways this as i said is a gigantic um, ambition and uh, very, very large scale development in order to not only convince our board, but our uh, yeah, shareholders and, and any stakeholders that, that would, would be part of this project, we have to demonstrate that we can do something uh, small scale first. Um, I always say every time I speak at conferences or in panels, um, there's not a single molecule of green hydrogen being produced in the Republic of Ireland at the moment. So we sometimes forget where we are uh, with all the ambitions that we are presenting here. So what I'm trying to say is that we have to do something small scale first to actually demonstrate that we can do this. And this is where the Mount Lucas Green Hydrogen Project comes into play. That is uh, now the link to uh, to Rory's presentation earlier because the Mount Lucas Green Hydrogen Project is part of the Shamrock uh, project. So the Mount Lucas Hydrogen Project is, as the name indicates, uh, located at the Mount Lucas Wind Farm. So the Mount Lucas Wind Farm is an 84 megawatt wind farm um, in, in Mount Lucas. Uh, it's operational for, I think, not eight or nine years at this stage. So um, it, it has served us really, really well. It's five kilometers away from the Eden Dairy Power Station. Um, we have completed the feed um, and preparation works on, on site have, have started. We are, what you can see here on the graph, we, we, we are planning to use um, the old construction uh, laid on area, construction compound um, to, to produce our hydrogen, green hydrogen there. Planning consent was received in May, 2023. Um, that was quite a huge step for us because it was the first green hydrogen project 
in the Republic of Ireland Eco Planning Consent. So um, good to get that to the system and set in a precedent for other projects that are 100% required. We're really supportive of any other uh, green hydrogen project in the country um, because we, we do believe that we all have to work together to get this uh, industry up and running. We are aiming to be producing green hydrogen in 25, 26, uh, depending on lead times for electrolyzers. Most of you probably have heard that those lead times are go only going one way and that's being pushed out. Um, so yeah, uh, that but that's the, the the timelines we are currently looking at. This project will produce about two hundred thousand uh, kg of green hydrogen per year in the first phase. As part of the Shamrock project, we are looking to extend that um, as as additional demand comes live. We are hoping to double uh, capacity at least for that, and the hydrogen will be used uh, for the mobility sector, as where we explained earlier. Um, it's it's not only. For, for us that we are producing green hydrogen, but it's, I think, and, and this came uh, through in, in Rory's presentation there, I think it's it's key that those pilot projects are absolutely essential to provide us knowledge um, about uh, hydrogen value chain. Uh, we'll provide the first green hydrogen uh, molecules to the market and really kickstart this industry. Um, I want to finish up my presentation, I'm conscious of time as well, but I want to finish it up by again, showing you another short little video clip of what this uh, production plant would look like. Um, every time I show this, uh, people are kind of underwhelmed, which is uh, uh, probably a good and a bad thing. Um, underwhelmed, well, the, the, the good, the, the, the bad thing about it is that you obviously want uh, people to be kind of, you know, uh, very positive about it. Uh, but the, the I, I guess the good thing is that um, people are underwhelmed because of the size that is required. We are only we are talking about a uh, containerized solutions here. It's 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 very small in scale. There's no visual impact. Um, it's it's very constrained in a way. You'll see that in a second. So I'm just gonna see if that. So what you can see here is basically Mount Rufus wind farm in the background. We have a direct connection. So the terminals are directly connected to the green hydrogen facility. We have uh, water wells on site. So uh, we are extracting the water there. And then you have those container solutions with your electrolyzer on site. You have a few hydrogen storage tanks, uh, water treatment facility there. And then you have the truck filling base. So the hydrogen uh, can be filled directly into the, the trailers um, that are there. So again, it's uh, it's quite contained um, in in itself. It's a very small footprint area that that we are taken up for for the hydrogen project. But uh, that the uh, the last thing that I would kind of want to mention is that uh, it's it is a two megawatt project. Um, a lot of people kind of smile when they hear two megawatt because there's a lot of people talking about hundreds of megawatts uh, in, in in mainland Europe. Um, to put it into context, two megawatts is, is still twice the demand that we currently have uh, in, in the Republic of Ireland for hydrogen, so for industrial processes and and in the mobility sector. So we think like a two megawatt project at the very start is a great way to kick it off. Then doubling their capacity to meet the additional Chamark demand will be great. And then we take it from there in phase two. So look, I hope I gave you a good overview of the energy park concept in general, and then the kind of little twist on on hydrogen as well. Happy to take any questions on that.